Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start off our event today for thanking, by thanking Databricks for sponsoring today's event. Databricks is a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. You know, I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Tableau, IBM, Alteryx, SciSense, Click, and Data Robot, to name just a few. Now, past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com. If you haven't had the opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide very useful insight into a wide variety of topics that are of interest to our data science community. So today's webinar is entitled, Deep Learning on Apache Spark, Best Practices, and that will be presented by Databricks. But before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be an hour long. Uh, we have one presenter who I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation. And this event is being recorded and will be available on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's live event. Now, I'd also like to encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker. That's Tim Hunter with Databricks. Tim is a software engineer at Databricks and a Spark committer to the Apache Spark ML Lab project. He's been building distributed machine learning systems with Spark since version 0.2 before Spark was an Apache Software Foundation project. Now, he earned his PhD from UC Berkeley in machine learning. He is the creator of the open source packages TensorFrames and is co-author of GraphFrames and Deep Learning Pipelines. So, Tim, thanks for being with us today. We're looking forward to your presentation. Now, the combination of deep learning with Apache Spark has the potential for tremendous impact in many sectors of the industry. So in today's data science webinar, uh, based on the experience gained in assisting customers with Databricks Unified Analytics Platform, we'll present some best practices for building deep learning pipelines with Spark. Now, rather than comparing deep learning systems or specific optimizations, this webinar will focus on issues that are common to deep learning frameworks when running Spark on a, on a Spark cluster, including optimizing cluster setup, configuring the cluster, ingesting data, monitoring long-running jobs, and Databricks will demonstrate the techniques we cover using Google's popular TensorFlow library. More specifically, uh, we'll cover typical issues users encounter when, when integrating deep learning libraries with Spark clusters. Now, clusters can be fig configured to avoid task conflicts on GPUs and to allow using multiple GPUs per worker. Now, setting up pipelines for efficient data ingest improves job throughput, and monitoring facilitates both the work of configuration and stability of deep learning jobs. So, Tim, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to talk to you today about uh, how to run deep learning pipelines on Apache Spark. So given the time that we have today, I will, uh, as Bill mentioned, I, I will not focus on the specific uh, runtimes or, or, or how to use specific libraries, but I want to focus more on the, uh, on how to integrate deep learning in general with Apache Spark and how to cast the, get the best of both worlds uh, from both on the distributed side for, for Spark, from the deep learning side with, um, with all these libraries and for machine learning uh, within uh, a single combination. So, to, so today uh, I would like to review with you uh, in um, the, the state, the current state of uh, deep learning in data pipelines and see how it is typically used by, um, by, by data scientists and by data engineers. Um, then uh, I will, uh, we'll look together at what are the best patterns that people, um, and also the, the recurring ways that people use when they integrate Spark and deep learning. 
And with that in mind, I will offer some uh, developer uh, insights that we learned from running many of these deep learning pipelines in, uh, in Databricks. And finally, I will start to, um, I'll mention a bit the, the issue also of monitoring these, uh, the, uh, these training pipelines and uh, in deep learning in general. So let's start with um, an, an overview of the field. So if you look at the, so if you, if you look at the, what happened in the, the recent years, um, really starting in, in 2016, but really this year, we have, we have seen an explosion of solutions that try to combine Spark and deep learning. Why, why would people want to do that? Well, a lot of data is being processed by Spark. It is really a, a popular project for running a lot of the of these large scale uh, ETL and uh, and data cleaning and data processing systems. And deep learning now is one of the de facto standards for running the um, for running complex machine learning tasks, especially in the domain of image processing or speech recognition, or major translation, and so on. And, and clearly, it is one, one, of the, um, one of the standard ways of for, for tackling these issues. However, if you look at all the, uh, if you look at what has been published or what has been presented so far, there is clearly no consensus on how to combine these different, um, these, these two technologies together. And if you look around the, especially around the Express ecosystem, there is a lot of approaches and a lot of libraries. So a lot of each of them try to combine, and each of them has a different approach into trying to integrate with Spark. Some of them try to integrate existing deep learning libraries with Spark. Some of some libraries are built from scratch on top of Spark. Some others try to modify directly Spark itself to run more efficiently. So there, there's no there, there's no clear consensus here. And furthermore, if you look at what is offered in MLlib the uh, standard machine learning that is uh, offered with Spark. Um, the support for deep, for deep learning and, uh, and uh, neural networks in general is very limited. Uh, all, you, all you have right now is uh, perceptron-like networks and a few basic training techniques that really do not represent uh, the state of the art in deep learning. So, so here is actually a, a brief overview of all the frameworks I am aware of uh, as of this moment. And actually, I learned about a, a new one just a week ago. So this tells you how fast the field evolves. Uh, so let, let's make a quick review of all of them so that we, we see a bit, uh, so that we, we see what is available uh, for us data scientists and data engineers. So, there's a, so if you have done deep learning, uh, you have probably chosen one of the main um, uh, main contenders uh, for the title of uh, popular deep learning framework between Cafe, Keras, NXNet, Paddle, TensorFlow, CNTK, and so on. And for each of these libraries, you can see uh, a, a number of uh, bindings that have been developed to incorporate these existing deep learning libraries on top of uh, on top of Spark. So, for example, in the case of CAFE, there is the CAFE on Spark project. In the case of Keras, which is a slightly higher level library written in Python, uh, the LSS framework is designed specifically for this. MXNet also has its uh, incorporated into uh, bindings. Uh, Paddle from Baidu also, also do that. And TensorFlow has not, not one, but two, but two different uh, ways of being integrated into Spark. One, uh, which is the TensorFlow on Spark project from Yahoo and the tens of frames, uh, which was released by Databricks. So this is if you want, this is, so all these projects um, are useful if you have already written some, um, some deep learning codes using one of these deep learning frameworks and you want to, to run, uh, you want to run them with Spark. There are also a, a, lo a lot of uh, different libraries that try more directly to incorporate inside Spark uh, by, by directly using, uh, by directly taking advantage of the Spark primitive for running and distributing calculations. Um, so some of the more popular ones are probably BDL, released by Intel, which focuses on, um, on leveraging the, the latest capabilities of the Intel processors. Uh, there is also Deep Dist, Deep Learning 4J, from uh, Deep Learning 4J, which is uh, directly building its own uh, GPU processing platform on top of Spark and in cooperation with Spark. Uh, then, of course, there is MLlib, which has its own support. And 
And finally, a uh, few other projects, such so as Spark CL, SparkNet, and Deep Learning Pipelines. We try to abstract all these frameworks and provide the more, um, a, a more comprehensive interface and a simpler interface to, um, to deep learning. And finally, for the people who really want to have, um, who really want to access the, 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 the underlying uh, uh, computing power directly, a number of projects have focused on using Spark for driving the computation. But then under the hoods, we're writing the, the calculations so they can directly take advantage of the hardware. Uh, so for example, there is the Blaze project from UCLA, and there is the IBM Conductor uh, project from, uh, with Spark from, um, from the IBM Corporation. So of course, uh, when you see this list, uh, it might seem a bit depressing because you, won't, you clearly wonder which one should I use, which one should I, what should I do? And one of the questions uh, that we get asked a lot is whether we should wait for the one framework that is going to rule them all and that is going to bind everything and provide a single solution to all your deep learning problem in a distributed manner. So before this framework happens, um, I, w I would like today to offer the perspective of Databricks. So as you know, Databricks provides a hosted uh, platform with Spark on, that runs on the public cloud, Amazon. And it provides also GPUs, so specific hardware, for, for computer-intensive workloads. And a number of our customers use uh, these deep learning frameworks, uh, specifically, more, more specifically TensorFlow, MXNet, Bigdeo, uh, Tiano, also Cafe, and, and a few others. And so we see a lot of, um, of different programming patterns, and we see a, different, a lot of different workloads being run in, in this public cloud for doing deep learning. So this talk is about the, the lessons we learned supporting a lot of these deep learning frameworks on top of the public cloud, and what we eventually saw and uh, what we eventually can recommend for people when they want to integrate deep learning and Spark. And today I would like to share with you some of these best practices. So if you look at, um, so when, when we think about machine learning, uh, we tend to think of the algorithms of really the core part that runs, uh, that, that, that powers uh, the, um, the system. But if you look at machine learning in general, um, the, the, the algorithms that we like to think about are actually a very tiny fraction of all the, um, of everything that makes up a, a good machine learning system. And I really like this image uh, coming from a NIPS paper published by Google uh, a year and a half ago, which really exemplifies and, and magnifies and, uh, the, the problem. Because when we, when we want to focus on the algorithm, we need also to take into account a large number of other components seeming, which are seemingly unrelated, but are critically important uh, if you want to run a, a such a system in practice. And this is especially important if you want to run a deep learning pipeline. Because deep learning tries to leverage uh, uh, some more advanced uh, hardware capabilities. It also is very hard to, uh, to train and to reason about. So in, the, so in this situation, figuring out the proper configuration, figuring out the proper way to ingest the data, figuring out how to serve the model after that is critically important for, uh, for good results. And, um, and, and so we'll, we'll see how, um, how, how, specific, how specifically the, the, these problems get magnified by deep learning. So there are really two, two ways to, um, to use uh, to to deploy um, machine learning and especially deep learning. Uh, one of them is is serving, and the other one is training. So let's start by uh, and let's start, let's start by training and see what, uh, what what kind of problems people encounter in practice. So if you want to run deep learning, deep learning in the data pipeline uh, in a training situation, so when you have some data that you have collected, you have a problem that you want, that you want to solve. For example, figuring finding all the, uh, for example, training a new uh, translating machine or training a new detector, then you first need to assemble your data, and then you need, to, and then you need to run a training algorithm on it. And and these correspond to very different um, uh, problems from a technical perspective. Because when you do data collection, when you do uh, cleaning and, and, uh, and processing at the beginning, then the, you, you tend to, uh, the problem tends to be mostly driven by moving data around the cluster. And the problem of, and, 
and, and, and, and the problem of uh, collecting and aggregating this data. And when you do that, the um, it is usually run on a on a very large cluster where you want to optimize for the for the throughput and you want to optimize for the uh, for the bandwidth. And in that case, you tend to run on a cluster with a lot of memory, and that doesn't have to run. That doesn't need to run a lot of computations. However, when times come to run deep learning, these algorithms and these frameworks tend to be extremely intensive in computations. Um, the, um, the term for that is the uh, is the operational intensity that is done on the, on the data, and this is usually done on a small cluster even usually just one machine, one very powerful machine, in which you do not need so much memory as much as you need a lot of computing power. So either in terms of CPUs or in the, or in the case of deep learning uh, GPUs, so a graphics, uh, graphic accelerator on the computers. Um, and and, and, and uh, then, so as you can clearly see here, there's a friction between between this data that is stored usually in a large distributed cluster, and then that needs to be moved into um, a, a smaller, um, a smaller cluster focused on uh, just on the com on the computation part. So in general, people tend to have um, uh, two different. So because of these two steps, people tend to have two different uh, clusters, and we'll, we'll some, and and also the, and then there is a, a need. To move the data back and forth between these uh, be between these, these two solutions. So using the cloud, thankfully here, simplifies a lot of the um, a lot of the process, because you can store all the data uh, in a distributed file system in a distributed storage system, and then the output of the of the first phase of the featureization and ETL part phase is directly available. Uh, through the distributed file system to a new cluster after that uh, that can run the deep learning the deep learning algorithms and after that you can once you have trained a the model then there is uh, a number of other steps to run some validation and to run so, or to export the models so this is for um, this is this is a brief overview for training so once once you have trained a the model then you want to apply it and usually you want to apply it in big batches of, uh, against big batches of data for example, if you have a lot of images of uh, cats and dogs, you want to be able to label uh, all the images with, by saying, you know, whether it's a cat or it's a dog. And so th this, is, this is a very different scenario from uh, the training scenario, because in training, the algorithms tend to do a lot of repeated passes over the same data over and over again, even if it is large data. In the case of transformations, it just, the, um, all the data tends to be processed just once and tends to just go through a system once to, to, then, to, to then be stored somewhere else. So in that case, it depends a bit on the application whether uh, this problem is going to be mostly driven, it's going to be limited by, um, by calculations or by simply by the network bandwidth because you need to, you need to fetch the images and then, you need to, and then you need to process them. And which step is going to take the longer depends a bit on the nature of the problem. If you are using some extremely complex neural networks, uh, for, for example, you know, VGG, uh, then the problem might be limited more by the, cal by the calculation time. But if you use some more compact uh, neural network representations, such as ResNet, for example, then these, these networks actually may not benefit too much from extra hardware and can even be run very efficiently on uh, just on the regular CPUs and do not need to have dedicated hardware to run. So, he, so here, depending on the nature of the problem, then you may actually have much simpler solution in practice uh, compared to the compared to the training phase. So, with with these two two big steps in mind, uh, let's look a bit at how people try to leverage Spark for this um, for the different steps. So, there, there are a number. So, if you look at the um, and, and training and uh, and transformation. There's a number of ways in which you can incorporate Spark and you, uh, to uh, to help you in your comp in your calculation. So the, the the easiest way is probably to run Spark as a scheduler. So in that case, you have a you have a lot of big, uh, you have a lot of uh, images, for example, that you want to process, um, and you do not and all that Spark does is that it schedules some computations. All in parallel to run to run some transform, for example, on the on the data. 
Um, and Spark is really good for doing this kind of very big manipulations, uh, which do not need to be driven by Spark, thanks to its interface uh, with Python or R, for example. Then there is, uh, at, at another level, the data itself uh, that you want to use for training or for transformation is, di is directly embedded inside the, the data represent the representation of Spark. For example, it is, it is represented in RDDs, the Resilient Distributed Data Set, the, the main abstraction for representing distributed data in Spark, or inside Spark data frames. So in, in this case, Spark is aware of the kind of uh, calculation that you're going to run on the data. Spark is not simply a black box. And in this scenario, then the, the transformation can be incorporated inside Spark, which means that you can run them into a more complex pipeline. For example, you can also incorporate other steps that uh, Spark would be good at, such as running SQL queries on top of it, or running or, or adding extra labeling and metadata extraction information all within the same pipeline. And finally, you have what uh, I would call the cooperative framework, in which Spark itself doesn't necessarily do the not necessarily does the computation, but it provides an interface for, the, for providing data in and, pro and getting data out after that. And uh, we'll see why it makes sense, specific, especially in the context of deep learning. So in all of this, uh, the, one of the main question is how to represent your data and how to store it. Usually, if you run Spark in a, in a distributed manner, then you have a couple of choices for storing your data. Um, it is very, very typical for the, for, for the data to be mostly stored in a distributed file system, such as S3, HDFS, and, uh, and some, other, some other solutions. Uh, but it takes a, usually it takes a while for to retrieve this data. So this is why it is typical to use uh, local files to um, to also have a, a quick access, especially nowadays with uh, the fast SSDs and uh, and hard drives that are available, even on cloud machines. As, and Spark can can also use its own persistent layer to leverage this uh, uh, the, the, the systems. So this is definitely faster. so this is usually faster than using uh, the network. And finally, the fastest of all is, of course, to store all the data in memory. Uh, and, and this is specifically what uh, Spark was designed to do, uh, using, uh, thanks to its RDD abstraction or its data frame abstraction. So if your data is small enough, you can leverage Spark to store all this data in the memory of the different computers. The, um, so, of, of course, then this is only, uh, only possible if, if um, if the data is small enough, and also if it makes sense to store it um, as in the in the memory. So, the, one of the most important steps when you run these deep learning pipelines is to figure out if you are going to be constrained by the by the network bandwidth, or if you are going to be constrained by the processing power. And and this depends a lot on the kind of network architecture you want to train and the size of your data set. Because if you run a NIST, then you can simply uh, take all the data sets and put, put it in the memory of each of the computers, and it is not going. And, and then you can run everything from memory. If you run with a lot, much larger data set, like like, like uh, ImageNet, for example, then depending on the number of, of machines that you have, you may not be able to to put everything in in the main memory, and then you'll need to use. Um, a different, then you'll need to access, then you'll need to use a system that can feed from uh, from files or from a distributed file system. And this distinction is very important if you use PySpark and if you use Python. So, but most of these frameworks have um, have an interface to Python, and usually this is the primary way that people interact with uh, TensorFlow or MXNet or um, or Theano. And the all these frameworks uh, have been heavily optimized for being able to read sequences uh, of images in batch from disk, because this is usually how they were developed uh, in, in the first use case in mind. And if you use uh, PySpark to to store your, uh, to to store your data and to access and to write your deep learning computations, then 
you have to be very careful into how you communicate data to Python to, um, to the uh, deep learning part. So if you have a small data set, the most convenient is to use Spark's broadcast mechanisms to, to put all to put the small data sets uh, that fit in memory and make it directly available inside the inside Spark. Then Spark will take care of the details of shipping over the data set into the different machines and communicate it efficiently to, um, to the Python side. And if you use uh, the, um, so if the data doesn't fit in memory, and it is usually, and if the program that you're running you runs in Python, then you are usually you're much better off using the uh, using files and directly reading from files using the deep learning framework uh, to to do all the loading and handling of the of the files. Um, why would you want to do that? The uh, well, reading from files is actually is really fast. It's it's uh, surprising, and also there there is a surprising number of um, surprising amount of complexity that is that has been built inside the uh, file system to be able to ingest and um, cache efficiently data data coming from uh, from disk. And also, if by default uh, in its current implementation, Spark communicates data to the Python side, so to the Python processor that we're deep learning using network, and it does a lot of expensive serialization and deserialization between each of the sides. And this, and this is much more expensive than, than just reading data straight from, the, straight from disk or just straight from memory. Which is why, uh, so this is why if you, if you use PySpark and if you use Python for doing deep learning in a distributed manner, uh, it is for now uh, more, uh, more efficient to directly read from, uh, from that. So now let, let's look at um, the, the frameworks that do not really uh, uh, try to integrate directly with Spark primitives, but still rely on Spark for, the, um, for all the distribution of the data. So a couple of uh, examples uh, come in mind for doing that. Um, one of them is um, IBM Conductor for Spark, the Deep Learning for J does that, and also a number of uh, other projects such as ThisML can read data from Spark, can output data after that to Spark, uh, to Spark, but in between they do not use the Spark primitives. So the reason for doing that is that the um, Spark itself provide a number of, um, of network patterns that do not work necessarily very well with deep learning. Uh, Spark is really focused on bulk synchronous operation, and deep learning can, can really take advantage of a small, small batch of computation being sent incrementally between the machines in an asynchronous manner. And um, this goes against the model, uh, the prior model of Spark, in which all the computation can be repeated and are, also, and are all synchronous. So this is why, from the perspective of Spark, uh, the, the deep learning frameworks really behave like a black box. They get some data at the, at the input in a local or distributed manner, and some computation will be run. They will not be repeated. They will not, they will not be able to be repeated. Uh, they will not, Spark will not be able to rerun some computation if something goes wrong, but it will run much much more efficiently than uh, if Spark was taking care of uh, some other communication for doing that. <laughs> so yeah, this frameworks uh, so by bypass Spark mostly for for doing all their asynchronous or of specific communications, and as I was hint as, as I was hinting before, if you lose a machine in the process. Then you may actually lose all the. You, so you, you you may you if you if you haven't configured correctly your uh, your deep, your deep learning training application, then you may actually lose all the all the intermediate results, and you may need to restart from scratch. So it has so it has some cost for doing that, and also, uh, uh, which to me is uh, pretty important. You will not be able to. So if you run, if you re, if you reconfigure your your cluster, for example, if you add an extra node to the machine, uh, an extra node to the cluster, you will probably get a different result at the end. So all these computations are not deterministic. If you if you don't if you don't use RDDs and if you use some of these uh, black box framework. So is it really a big problem in practice? It depends a bit on uh, what you aim to achieve. In general, when you when you run deep learning uh, training sessions, 
uh, these, these sessions have a lot of inherent stochasticity, they have a lot of inherent randomness, and you will, even on a local machine, you would probably get different results because it's, uh, because of its heavy use of uh, random numbers. So in the, this is why in the context of deep learning, it is usually accepted that if you run things in a distributed manner, Spark is of little help to try to uh, handle the resilience of, uh, and the reproducibility of the result at the end. So I really like this, uh, this quote also from, uh, attributed to Leon Batu, one of the, the fathers of modern deep learning, and in which he states that if you want to have reproducibility, uh, you have to consider whether it is, um, uh, if you want to trade reproducibility for, um, for speed, um, you have to see if, if the benefits outweigh the cost. And in this case, the cost is that you cannot un understand or reproduce the result that you got. So according to him, if you have machines which are twice as fast or processes twice as fast, then it may be worth losing the ability to reproduce and um, uh, your, your, your training procedure. Uh, personally, I put the threshold at, at a much higher level, probably at a factor of 10, because I like to understand what is happening in the process. But this is a bit different depending on the, on the taste here. So after this overview for, um, on, on, how to, on, on how, to, how to run in general uh, deep learning and Spark, uh, let me offer you a couple of more points to the developer tips and, and some guidance uh, to help you develop some of, these, uh, some of these systems and how to use them in practice. So one of the most important aspects when you're training is uh, the, how to pick, how to choose, and how to configure hardware for maximum efficiency. So as I was mentioning before, deep learning is usually very expensive um, in its training phase and uh, from a computation perspective. So this, this is why it is common to use it with GPU machines, which provide some significant acceleration when you want to run some, calcul some, uh, some, some uh, training procedures. And GPUs are hard to use uh, in, in a single, uh, single machine setup, and even harder to use in, uh, in, in a large cluster, which is something that, that comes important when you want to run a lot of experiments in parallel. So if you look at, um, if you, if, if you look at, uh, at Spark, it, given the project of its complexity, it has actually a few dependencies. And you can, you can start from a machine, if you start to compile Spark from scratch on the machine, all you need really is Python, uh, the, the Java development kit, and that's, and that's uh, nearly that's about it. A lot of care has been, has been spent on making sure that Spark works very well in a lot of uh, different environments. And GPUs are exactly the opposite in, in some sense, because they are really dedicated uh, platform that tries to optimize uh, the the the, uh, the the computation, uh, the computation throughput, uh, at the expense of uh, just about anything else in terms of convenience or in terms of um, of a nice environment. Because if you want to use a GPU, you need to install a CUDA. So typically, if it is for a GPU from uh, the NVIDIA Corporation. They need to install the, the, the development kit, CUDA. You need to install a number of support libraries specifically for doing deep learning, such as UDNN, CUBLAS, and so on. You need to have some dedicated drivers uh, to access the hardware and so on. And this, is, this makes all in all a very deep software stack that requires some careful construction because there are only a certain config uh, configuration of hardware and drivers and CUDAs and then built-in library on top of that that, uh, that work together to deliver maximum efficiency. And if you don't have any, if you're missing one of these layers, you will not get the benefit of GPUs. So all of these must be uh, expected by the users. So now we start to see some turnkey stacks uh, that are available and the start to appear. Uh, mostly, if you're uh, using the AWS environment from Amazon, then there's a couple of AMIs that are available containing all these uh, all this software. But sometimes they are missing some um, some other important some other aspects, such as either a deep learning library or an interactive environment for ease of use. So and. In the case of Databricks and of, of uh, providers and maintainers of a uh, of fleet of computers, 
it is it is important to be able to uh, uh, to have seamless upgrades so that users do not notice when the hardware gets upgraded, when some of the software also gets upgraded. So this is why it is common to provide either um, an AMI or uh, Docker images that contain all the dependencies and that pre-install all the drivers uh, that are required. So this is done uh, for, uh, for for users in Databricks. Uh, if you're using uh, if you're using something by yourself, uh, then NVIDIA has a project called NVIDIA Docker, or even Linux containers can directly do that. And this way, you can abstract out the the hardware in a way that uh, allows more seamless upgrades and the changes under the hood. So if you're using GPU through Python and PySpark, uh, there are a number of challenges, uh, like, like I mentioned already before, for accessing the data. But there are also some other challenges which are specifically related to the uh, use of GPU themselves. So as I was mentioning, most people use Python when they want to develop uh, some, de some deep learning training algorithms, uh, simply because it's, um, it's a very popular language for data science, and it's a very popular in interface language for these uh, deep learning framework. But it makes a number of assumptions. So if you, if you look at uh, all these uh, Python packages that provide deep learning facilities, their lifetime and their, their expe the expectations are that they're going to live throughout the whole process. And this doesn't work in Spark because in the Spark model, the, um, the one, uh, each of the workers has one or multiple uh, long-living uh, Python processes, which get some tasks from the users, uh, deserialize the task, run the task, return some results, and then wait for the next time, well, wait for the next task to come. So in the, in the Spark world, Python is not expected to be uh, coming up and down because it has some cost. It takes a few seconds to do that. And in the case of GPUs and in, in the, um, deep learning, this causes some problems. Mostly because when these tasks come in uh, com and when they access the hardware, uh, they, do, they open, they use some resources on the hardware. And these resources do not get cleaned up usually after the, um, after the, um, once, once, once the, the, the process finishes. Or these uh, resources try to get used at the same time by multiple uh, Python workers. So, if there is uh, one change, one recommendation that you should use your Spark cluster, it is probably to set this configuration flag. Uh, Spark the number of uh, cores for each executor is set to one. So if you, when you do that, you will instruct Spark to run only one Python task at the, uh, on each of the workers. And you may think this is limiting. However, we, each of these deep learning frameworks tries usually to, to usually assume that they are the only one running the computations on the GPU, and they try to leverage as much as they can the resource on the GPU. Um, and if you do not set this, and if you have multiple uh, of these processes trying to use the same GPUs, uh, then they tend to try to oversubscribe to the resources, and you get to, ha and, and you end up with some fairly hard to debug and um, uh, errors about resources not available. And then usually you need to restart the cluster because uh, these, um, these, these, resources, these uh, resources are not being cleaned up properly on the GPUs. So this is, uh, this is, especially, uh, this is especially, uh, especially important for the for frameworks that try to optimize the resources they use inside, the, uh, inside their pipelines, such as TensorFlow. So now let's look at one of the probably one of the most important aspects of for for deep learning, which is understanding what is happening inside the computations and monitoring whether they, they do some good progress. So up to now, um, there is not really a good solution for that, because if you look at the if if you look at the one, what is happening inside the Spark computation. Um, uh, I tend to have a comment that it, it tends to look like a big black hole in which you don't know really what is happening inside. So how would you do monitoring for these, uh, for, for these cases? Uh, it depends a bit on the, in, uh, it depends a bit on, on the framework that you use and on the granularity of the task that you run. 
So if you use a framework like BigDL, which relies on Spark for doing its uh, for doing communication between the machines, um, then Spark has a deeper insight as, about the, the about the patterns and about the communication that is happening uh, between the between each of the each between each of the tasks uh, that are related to deep learning. If you are using another framework, uh, which is more a black box, such as TensorFlow and Spark, for which Spark has no knowledge and about what is happening inside, then you have to use some uh, some different uh, some different tasks. So if you use a framework like uh, BigDL, for example, uh, you can check easily the the throughput or the failure rate, for example, to see if images are being uh, ingested fast or if they are being dropped or if they're not being processed correctly, uh, using accumulators. So this works well if you want to use Scala. And for now, the support is a bit limited for, for Python, but this is being addressed. So this works essentially by providing counters uh, that you can access in real time across different, um, different steps of your computation. So this way, you can see how many images are being, are being loaded or are being, uh, are being processed and so on. The, um, in the case of deep learning, it is although more and more common to use another external system that you can plug inside your computations. Um, so one way to so what, one way to do that is to use a system, like an existing solution such as Grafana, Graphite primitives, which are really more system uh, geared towards um, uh, monitoring the performance of um, of a general um, of, of general services. Uh, and now more and more, uh, these, these, all these all these frameworks can output some files, uh, which which contain uh, which contain uh, metrics uh, that are specific to deep learning, and that then you can load using the TensorBoard tool from uh, Google that is embedded inside TensorFlow. So if you have a distributed file system, then you can fetch all these logs and ag and collate them onto a single machine to display them into. Um, into a single uh, into a single system. So, as a conclusion, uh, definitely deep learning is, uh, <clears throat> is is a fast and and very exciting very exciting space uh, nowadays, uh, especially if you want to use uh, deep learning in a distributed manner. Um, up to now, most of the insights that you will gain, for, especially in training, are very specific to the task the data set, and the algorithm that you want to use. And for now, nothing replaced some experiments uh, against a specific, um, against, against a specific uh, configuration. So it is certainly easy. So if you want to start by combining Spark and uh, for doing deep learning, definitely the easiest is to start uh, on this, on data parallel job. And in, in which you try to run a lot of uh, single machine experiments. And this already can give you a lot of uh, insight about what works and what doesn't. Because a lot of time can be spent simply on trying out a number of hyperparameters to, to explore the configuration space of your training system. Once you want to move beyond that, then you can start to look at cooperative frameworks as to flow and Spark or, uh, that, uh, that can help you when your data gets too large and when you want to start to distribute the computation between multiple machines. So there are definitely some, some challenges that uh, the, the Spark developers can address. Some of them are how to monitor a long-running task. Uh, there is, some, there is some, um, some framework already available inside Spark, but right now it is not uh, sufficient for a number of uh, de deploying solutions. And also, Spark doesn't let you access uh, the intermediate result produced by long-running tasks. And this is something that uh, is being looked at inside the MLE community. And also, for if you are uh, developing your own framework he, uh, for doing deep learning, um, here is the, probably the, some of the, the most critical um, uh, design point that, that you need to make. One of them is what boundary you want to put between the algorithm and Spark. Do you want to leverage the distributed primitive uh, to, um, from Spark so that you can you don't need to care about the communication between the machines, 
or do you want to go deeper in, in this sense and try to directly have your own uh, communication system between the machines? That, that's, that's one of the, the most uh, impactful design choices that you can do inside the, inside the library. So if you want to know more about that, uh, Derrick has published a number of, um, of blog posts on the, on the topic. Um, so especially we, we, are, we are explaining more in details how to do a GPU acceleration, uh, how to get started with deep learning and Spark. Um, also, if you want to use Intel's Big Gear library, uh, we have uh, some, uh, some, exp some explanation tutorial for doing that. And finally, if you want to run some uh, specific examples, such as uh, deep learning pipelines with tensor frames, then we provide um, deeper, uh, we provide longer explanations on how to on how to do that. And uh, finally, I encourage you to uh, to check out the, uh, the the documentation that we have on deep learning on the Bricks because a lot of it is also applicable to other um, open source system as well. And also, um, we'll be talking a lot more about these topics at the Spark Summit in Europe in Dublin, in uh, which happens in a bit in a month now. And there is still some, it's still some time to register and if you want to go there. And there is a discount code here, Terabricks, that you can use if you want to, uh, to go there. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, without further ado, I'll let Bill now take over for the questions. Well, Tim, thanks for that excellent presentation. Uh, so we'll get started with today's Q&A session. And I want to thank the audience for their participation because we've had a lot of questions that have come in. And we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. So uh, during this Q&A session, I'll leave up this screen with contact information for Tim if you'd like to get a hold of him following today's webinar. So Tim, uh, let's get started. Tim, you are the, the uh, author of TensorFrames. Uh, is that still available on uh, the open source version on Spark, or do we need to use the Databricks product? And if we're going to use Databricks, is, is there an advantage to using Databricks with TensorFlow? Yes, so, that, um, so TensorFrames is a, is, a, is a framework that lets you integrate the um, computations expressed using TensorFlow directly inside Spark. So uh, you have seen uh, all the points I've made about, uh, about the, the communication problem between Python and uh, between PySpark and, uh, and deep learning. And TensorFrame lets you bypass all these uh, all these issues by directly allowing you to read data from uh, Spark data frames, uh, directly putting them inside TensorFlow. So this is a totally open source project. You can download it as a Spark package. Uh, if you Google uh, TensorFrame, actually, you will see some um, some explanation for that. And the um, so it is also available as a library in Databricks. In Databricks, you also have uh, some uh, a, a few. Um, so the version for Databricks ha has a few optimizations uh, to make it a bit faster on the, um, for the environment that we provide inside Databricks. But in any case, you can still, you, it is definitely available as an open source project, and you can, you can try it out now. Okay, thank you for that answer. Now, the audience has uh, a, a couple of questions asking for clarification about some of your earlier slides, so let me just uh, ask these uh, two questions together. There was a question about what you meant by cold layer. Was that the same as the native data input format? And also asked for some more a description about what you were speaking of when you talked about cooperative frameworks. Yes. Um, so. Yeah, so th these are really uh, core questions about the about how to present your data and and how to um, and how and how to uh, run computations in a context of training. So, back back, uh, let me get this slide. So yeah, back by uh, cold layer, I meant essentially the durable storage on which you're going to store most of um, most of your data, and. If, especially if you have images, if you have images, it is typical to represent them as um, uh, it, it is it is typical to represent them as um, uh, in, inside S3 or HDFS because this data is usually accessed um, not very often, but it is um, but at the same time it is it is usually a, a, um, required. And at very a very specific point in time, for example, when you want to run uh, computations. So by cold layer here, I meant to refer to um, 
to, to the dribble storage system, such as S3 or HDFS, or if you're using uh, Debrix, the DBFS uh, file system. Um, now, about the cooperative frameworks, these, so these frameworks, um, so th these frameworks are aware of Spark in the sense that they know about um, and they, they know about how Spark schedules the um, uh, the, the computations. They know about uh, the uh, how to ingest data from Spark. They know how to read the Spark data frames. But the communication system, the communication uh, primitive they use, do not fit inside the Spark um, the, the Spark system. So the way the way these frameworks work, and as an example, there is TensorFlow and Spark, or there is planning for J. Um, so the way this this framework uh, work is by scheduling some resources, or some long running resources on the Spark cluster. For example, uh, they take over the um, a number of, of nodes on the Spark cluster, and then they will communicate with each other in a way that is independent of, uh, of Spark. So all the, all the Spark sees when when, it, when you run some of these frameworks is that you have a lot of uh, you have a number of very long running tasks on the on, on the, these nodes that eventually uh, relinquish uh, that eventually produce some data. But for example, he, uh, here when I, what I mean by very long, that might be you know a day or two days even. Of, uh, of running computation on a single node uh, that Spark then cannot use. So in that sense, uh, Spark is being used uh, to ingest some data, and it is being used to um, to schedule resources on the cluster. But usually, this is uh, completely transparent from uh, from the perspective of the user. Well, Tim, thanks for that clarification. Uh, now, you know something very fundamental about Spark. Uh, is, is Spark automatically managing the GPU and CPU resources um, and, and deciding what the uh, workload should be for optimal usage, or are those hyperparameters that I have to adjust myself? Yeah, so, so here the, there are two aspects to, um, to this question. The, the first one is how, how much is Spark aware of the kind of computation it runs? And also, if you are using GPU and, and, um, and CPUs, um, it's, you have usually a lot of parameters that you need to tweak, and how much can Spark help you in, in that respect? So Spark itself has no concept of, uh, of uh, GPUs, and uh, there are a couple of, if you look at the, at the mailing list on, uh, for Spark, and if you look at, uh, at the issues report on Spark, uh, there, there is a number of ongoing discussion about uh, such a support. Usually, this is... Um, so this is handled directly by the, the manager, by, by the underlying manager of the cluster. So if you use a yarn in a, in a large distributed system, uh, then a yarn, it's, uh, yarn, yarn as a resource manager has, is aware of these resources. Um, it is, for, for most users though, it is usually, and because the, the needs between the, between um, the pre transformation and then the and then the computation for doing training are so different, it is usually easier to to have a dedicated cluster or to launch a dedicated cluster uh, that has um, that has GPUs and that is aware and um, so that Spark doesn't need to be aware that it needs to run uh, some operation on GPUs. If you launch a separate cluster on the G on a cluster on the, on the number of machines that contain GPUs, then you do not need to to add a specific information into Spark for um, for running on GPU machines. So also so that that brings the question of um, how to how to efficiently leverage these uh, these machines and also how how Spark can help uh, in this context. So usually when you want to run deep learning jobs. Uh, you have a lot of hyperparameter to tweaks, and you know if you do, are doing trainings, uh, then you have probably spent some time uh, trying to find the, the proper um, the, the proper coefficients and uh, for for doing uh, for, uh, for example for um, for your gradient descent and the proper scheduling rate and mini batch size and so on, and there is no clear answer uh, that uh, there 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 is no clear rule of thumb that works in all the all the cases. And usually it is best to simply try out a number of these parameters and see which one works, uh, give you the best result. And in that, uh, and in that case, Spark can help you by launching a lot, by, by letting you launch a lot of computation in parallel, each of them with a, with a different set of uh, hyperparameters. And then you can see which one is going to, um, to give you the best result in the end.
Oh, Tim. Yeah, thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, so I think we all understand that uh, in in Spark, our, our primary language choices are Python and Scala, but there's always going to be uh, some folks that, that want to run R. So the question from the audience is, uh, if I want to use R with a Spark interface like Spark R, uh, is the is it Spark data frames running on Spark ML lib libraries, or is it R data frames running on ML lib, or is it some R algorithms? Yeah. So if you want to do deep learning, so if you want to do deep learning, distributed deep learning with R. Um, so I, I'm not personally um, aware of um, of all of the efforts that are happening within the R community to provide. Um, uh, support for deep learning. Uh, I know that there's a project for uh, running TensorFlow on R. Um, so what you can do is, in this case, is uh, you, you can you can still actually use uh, Spark to uh, to leverage these uh, these deep learning capabilities in R um, simply by running um, by by having some so sim simply by using the, the primitives inside the inside Spark in which you can provide functions with parameters, uh, for, uh, for example, if you want to distribute uh, parameters inside the, uh, across multiple machines, then if you have uh, a script that lets you run some in, uh, R script that lets you run some computations on a single machine, then you can use Spark to distribute the script over multiple machines to try out different parameters. So if your data is stored, if your, if your, if your image data is stored, for example, in the Spark data frame, then you can also apply you can also apply a transform on this uh, on this data frame using R. Um, that being said, the, all the caveats that um, I presented in the case of Python are, are certainly as valid, if not even more so, in the case of R. And there is a significant cost in uh, taking some data represented in Spark and doing some computations on the R side on this uh, this data. So in that case, you you are usually better off uh, trying to directly schedule these, uh, these computations in um, in a distributed manner, but have each of these um, each of these computations directly fetch data from either from disk or from um, or from a distributed file system to run uh, some the, the, to run some processing on that. Well, Tim, thank you. Uh, and uh, just for a final question uh, in our time remaining. A number of audience uh, members have asked about uh, distributed TensorFlow with Spark. What, what's your experience with that? Any drawback? Uh, yeah. So distributed Tensor. So there is. Um, so TensorFlow itself has a has a number of primitives and a number of ways to run a distributed TensorFlow. Um, at a high level comment, uh, I'd like to to reemphasize the fact that. Distributing, so using distributing, so doing TensorFlow, writing it um, TensorFlow code is not easy. Um, writing distributed TensorFlow code and understanding why it doesn't work uh, is even more challenging. Okay. So you, people should definitely consider. So people, uh, as a first step, people should definitely consider using distributed TensorFlow if they really feel that they will, if they really have a compelling need uh, to uh, to do that. The uh, so. That being said, uh, there Spark offers a number of solutions to um, to help you distribute uh, your computations uh, within TensorFlow on um, on a cluster. Um, some of the most prominent projects for doing that uh, is probably um, one of the one of the most prominent projects probably TensorFlow on Spark, uh, released by Yahoo. Um, and this is in this case. You Spark is, is so it is one of these cases of um, of cooperative frameworks in which TensorFlow uh, and Spark takes care of a number of common problems such as ingesting data from Spark or, or scheduling the resources and setting up the communication between the machines in, uh, using Spark, and then you can run your distributed TensorFlow uh, code between these machines and. Uh, TensorFlow and Spark will take care of uh, releasing the resources that you are, that you are using when your computation eventually completes. So it is, well, it is definitely one of the. Uh, yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, great answers to some very good and deeply detailed questions. And for those of you that asked questions today that weren't answered, uh, we'll be sending all the unanswered questions to Tim and the Databricks team. 
so that they can follow up with you after today's webinar. Now, I have just a few quick announcements. Uh, if you would please mark your calendar for September 28th, that's tomorrow, uh, and our next DSC webinar, which is going to be Human in the Loop Deep Learning, and that will be sponsored by Crowdflower. Also remember that today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing, and if you're like me, you probably want to review today's tape. Uh, so that will be available later today, and you can find that on the home page of Data Science Central in the Webinar tab located at the top of the page. Well, this brings today's webinar to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions. A special thanks again to Databricks for their sponsorship, and particularly to our speaker today, Tim Hunter, for his deep insight into today's topic. Uh, this is Bill Voorhees, and I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on September 28th, tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you, Bill.